just trying to figure out how to make everything work today. Got a bunch of variables. Are you guys hearing me okay? Is this working? Um, just trying to figure out if we're on. What a mess. Yes. Hey, sorry for that rough start. It's been a little bit of a haywire thing here. I've been out in the observatory trying to help our scope cam, and I think we finally have it working. Uh, the camera view you're seeing, I've just put out there a minute or two before. That's a, a Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph that you see there on the left. It's uh, Here's a snapshot of it when the lighting's a little bit better. It's an 11-inch telescope, and uh, down there at the bottom, you see a little outrigger bar, a little uh, uh, rig roar in to be able to see this. Um, sorry about the rain and the wind there in UK. Angela, good to have you on from Glendale, Arizona. If you guys don't mind, say hello there. Uh, Mike, if you wouldn't mind, kind of check in if you can hear this audio okay. It uh, seems like it should be working on this end, maybe a little bit hot. Do you think, is it a little bit over modulating? Maybe I should turn it down just a little bit. Um, hey, Mike, good to have you aboard as well. All right, well, let's get started. We're gonna try to chase some targets from Stephen James O'Meara's Hidden Treasures book. And what he did is he, uh, he curated about 109 objects that uh, to him were often overlooked and some objects not even available in atlases and all. So we're gonna start here with uh, what he called X9. And he uses the X as in uh, pirate treasure, hidden treasures, X marks the spot. And his number nine object on his list of 109 objects is X9 NGC 908, a galaxy in Cetus. So let's look at what the, um, the scope is looking at here. We've already done a, um, a, um, we've already done a plate solve. So we're supposed to be looking at the right part of the sky. Let's uh, come over here in our pre-processing and make sure we've got the right darks here. Let's see, that's from, um, January of 2021, here we go, let's take this one, November of 2022, and then let's make sure we've got the right flat. That's January 12th of 2022, so that's correct. Now, let's, um, what else do we need to do? Let's look at this display histogram and reset this. Sometimes I notice in this version it's better if we reset this. And then let's start live stacking and reset the live stack. And uh, while that's, uh, let's see, let's go with about 20 seconds at 100. And let's reset this again with that um, crazy, um, satellite trail, and let's see. The, uh, the camera in the observatory had failed. Uh, when we got everything going tonight, the scope cam that you th see there, that camera was black. So we had to go out, and I just happened to have another camera like it, and that enabled us to be able to, um, to hook up another camera. And boy, it was lucky that we had that other camera because, um, Otherwise, we would have never been able to kind of, you know how it sort of helps to be connected to your scope. Um, so there we go with that. And then let's bring up the mids. And there, I think we're starting to see a galaxy right there in the middle. Let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, that's 100% of our Rasa's frame, and it's an APS-C frame. Ricky, good to have you on from Florida. Hope you've got clear skies down there. Corwin, thanks for verifying that audio. I, you, and Mike, you too, thanks. I use this audio for a couple different things and I always have to adjust the gain and I sometimes forget to put it back. All right, while that's live stacking, I think you guys all are uh, familiar with live stacking, but if you're watching this as a YouTube video and you're just now learning about live stacking, that's a process of taking a 20 second, in our case, we were using 20 second exposures, and letting the computer software stack them together so it averages out the darks and averages out the suns. 
It's receding at 1,508 kilometers per second. It's a beautiful pinwheel seen 20 degrees from edge on. And it does look like it's been affected, affected by something. Um, like something has, has gone by it and pulled apart some of the spirals, huh? Um, clear and setting up yourself, Ricky, that's awesome. John, good to have you on board from Magdalena, New Mexico. Azra, good to have you on from Arizona. Three dominant spiral arms spiral outward, and uh, there are four crossings of major axis by arms on both ends. Wow. So let's, uh, let's use our little clip. This is perhaps one of the most important parts of this book. We have to clip these pages so they don't fly closed. And let's... Let's go ahead and go past our optical zoom and do a little more digital zooming here until we start to notice some pixelation right around in there maybe. Let's bring up our mids a little bit more. You know, I don't find that this white level really changes much. I, I sometimes just forget about it the whole night because uh, if you bring it over here, I don't think it really makes that much difference, but I wonder if I bring it over there if it will. Look how there are some other colors in there, maybe blues. Now this is where the spiral arm is starting to scatter out. Look at that. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more using our digital zoom. Now there is some pixelation there, but I think it'll let us see the structure. See how that arm just sort of spirals out in several directions. This is uh, four minutes of integration. So what we'll do is we'll um, hook up our observing window here from Deep Sky Planner. We can pull this over here, and for our session, we want to pick tonight. I think this is, I forget, 100 and, 101 or 102, maybe 102. I forget how many sessions. 102 sessions, I think. We're going to say, wow, this is a beautiful galaxy with uh, arms that seem to have been affected by some unseen tidal force. T-I-D-A-L, like the tide, tidal force. In other words, we're talking about the tide of gravity. Um, said to be around, what do you say, 80? Got to move my clip now to get back to that first page. Do you say 85? I'm sorry, um, 80, seems like you said 86. 86 million light years is 58 million light years away. 86 million light years across uh, 58 million light years away. This is X9 or NGC 908. Obviously, we've never observed this before. Uh, it's our brand new, it's our brand new friend here. Look at that. Now these other stars give it a nice context, don't they? Let's uh, um, deep sky planner, and we um, write control F and um, look for NGC 908. Timed out waiting for Stellarium to start. Okay, okay, okay. NGC 908. There we are. Okay, so you can see this is the south polar, the south pole here. By the way, that's my truck, and that's right where it's parked tonight. If you look over here, you can see a building, and that's the building I'm in. I'm here in this corner office, and boy, it's warm in here. Now, outside, it's 27.7 degrees on the scope. Anyway, right there is where we're looking. So we're up above the, um, the south polar region, about 30 degrees. So let's zoom in on this. Yeah, look at that. That's a beautiful view of it, isn't it? Look how these arms are, are scattered, just like we're seeing in our picture. This is a little bit more beautiful view. Look at that. Uh, all those star-forming regions, these bluish, bluish regions. Uh, so let's turn on the constellations so that we get a, an idea of um, what Cetus looks like here. 
So there's our field of view, the Rasa. And um, here's Eridanus, and there's Cetus. I think it's supposed to be a whale. So if you were to look at Orion, where the three belt stars are, and then go a little bit down and toward the west, that's where you're going to find this, right above the south region. NGC 908. And he's right. I mean, this is a very little known galaxy, even though it's very beautiful, isn't it? Uh, let's bring our mids up a little bit more. Now we're starting to get too much grain in the sky, aren't we? So it's a bit of a balancing act here, isn't it? Look how this, uh, see this little arm here now is very clearly discernible from its part of the disk. And look how this arm is being thrown out. Maybe this is an arm and that's an arm. So maybe we've got one, two, three, four arms, just like Omira said. That's uh, nine minutes. Let's go ahead and capture an image exactly as seen here. And uh, what do you guys think of this? Are you seeing this okay? Have you guys ever observed NGC 908 before? I bet, uh, Mike, you've probably done it before. Got about tons of Stellarium. I think we can... Tracking enabled. And, uh, whoa, it won't stay. That's not good, is it? All right, let's do this. Let's, let's cut out of this um, sequence, stop, and let's uh, try to go back to um, let's try to go back to the pole star at Polaris. So there you can see the scope as it skews over, slews over to the North Star. On the right, you see that sky cam live view. That's uh, the uh, monochrome ASI 178 camera that's riding on top of the scope. Getting a lot of hourglassing, but it's stormy here. Might be, I don't know, Mike, it might be on this end as well because twice OBS has come up and said, Good, I've reconnected. So I wonder if maybe it's on this end as well. Okay, so now we're pointed at the North Star, supposedly again. And there you see it in the live screen right there. So what we'll do now is we'll go back to the zero position. We'll say set current position as zero position. And we'll sync one more time with the time with the PC. And now we'll try to enable tracking again. Okay. For some reason now, uh, that time it seems to have stuck. So we're going to close that and hope for the best. And uh, now let's see. I think I think all of our programs are still connected to ASCOM. ASCOM is the bridge that enables them to all speak. So let's go back to our And let's do this observation again. Just going to add that in and say OK. Uh, it made me select a session again. So add the observation. We're going to select January 14th as the session. Add those observation notes in, and now that's gone. So our next object is NGC 1232. And we're going to slew to that. And it's uh, X9, I'm sorry, X11 on uh, Stephen James O'Meara's list. So let's go down to this title and change this to X11. And it's NGC 1232. And it's a galaxy in Iridanus. can see the scope moving, and that's live on the left there. The only little light that you see in the Roloff Roof Observatory is the little bitty tiny LED on the roof garage door opener. <laughs> that's what that is, a, a garage. It's like a gate opener. 
for the roof, and that's got a little LED on it. That's the only uh, light you see there in the observatory. Otherwise, that light is um, actually just, uh, what would you call it? night vision, I guess. Okay, let's come back to the screen. I'm going to go up here in sharp cap and make sure we put in here the NGC 1232 on, thinking about it. Now let's do a um, plate solve here. Make sure we're on the right part of the sky. Since this is our first slew again, um, scope, because we had to go back to the North Star and re, um, restart, we're, oh, not bad. It looks like 20 seconds and a, a gain of 100. And let's start live stacking. And then we'll look up what um, we'll look up what uh, Steve one with the younger eyes might. It's a cosmic wonder in photographs, a veritable maelstrom of starlight. Nature's attempt to mimic what can only be imagined as the eye of God. Huh. To peer into the lens of light at the core of NGC 1232 swirling arms is to peer into a well of eternal questions. Uh, Cambridge Platonist Joseph Glanville wrote, The ways of God in nature are, as in providence, are not our ways, nor the models that we frame, any way commensurate to the vastness, profundity, and unsearchableness of his works, which have a depth in them greater than the well of Democritus. It's a fantastic system, and he tells about all the group. He says the arms don't spiral out from the edge of a high surface brightness disk. Only two major arms can be seen. Uh, there's a long row of suns to the west. Yeah. All the arms are filled with H2 regions. Says there is a barred spiral in the same view. Whether it's a true companion, it can be a debate. Four minutes to the east. So we'll have to see if we can spy that barred spiral. Uh, this is used in ARP's red ship argument. Talks about the companion galaxy says that NGC 1232 exhibits a strange deformity or flattening, highly redshifted, far exceeds the main galaxy. So I guess the galaxy is maybe skewing. And he talks quite a bit about the physics of this. And then uh, he discusses how difficult it is to pick up. But boy, using electronically assisted astronomy, which is this technique of stacking frames, uh, it looks like we're, we're picking up. I'm going to reset this display histogram. And then let's reset our histogram down here and do another color balance. And then bring these darks in. It's odd, isn't it, that our previous color balance is actually better. We're going to bring these reds up a little more so they're in balance with the rest of the, of the colors. There we go. It's maybe a little too much. Now let's bring the blue down a little bit so it's in balance with that. I'm doing this manually because the auto color balance really failed us. There we go. Now you see how those peaks are aligned. Now let's bring these mids down, or over I should say. What we do when we're, when we're fooling with these bars, we're like redefining what's going to be black and what's going to be the mid-level. Now let's zoom in from there. 
Behold the eye of God, at least the nickname, the eye of God. <laughs> Keep bringing those mids up until our entire sky washes out. Angela says a great view. Azrae, nothing a little black duct tape won't fix. On that LED, you're right. You know what, Azrae, dedicated to you, that's what I'm going to do. You know, this reminds me of another galaxy. What am I thinking of? Is it, is it M100 that sort of reminds us of this, guys? Boy, look how far this arm is. I bet maybe this is that companion galaxy out here, you think? Out here to the lower right? And I bet you anything that companion galaxy has just, over the last 100,000 years or whatever, has scored through this and taken with it a lot of gases. Anyway, look how these star-forming regions are kind of spinning out of control. It looks sort of like a, a pinwheel, doesn't it? Bright core that we can see there. This is with just five minutes of integration. So in other words, five minutes of stacking, but just look how much detail we're starting to see. This is at 200% of the, of the 2600's native, um, I guess, uh, you know, resolution. So we're actually into the digital zoom here quite a lot. But that helps us see the structure. I'll put it back at 100% just so you can get a perspective on how big this is. While that's stacking just a little bit more, let's go back over to uh, Stellarium and we're going to look for NGC 1232. I've got to figure out why um, Stellarium is not uh, meshed correctly with our targeting software. So there you see we're still due south. Help the algorithm with a like. Thank you for your work, man. Spaced out, that's very kind of you. Uh, he's reminding all of us that maybe if we could like the video, that might help uh, others find it. So here's Orion. If you get a picture of that, the belt stars, if you go, if you go down along the direction of the feet, in the Rigel's direction, in other words, and kind of cast a line from the left belt star, in other words, kind of where M42, that side of the belt, through Rigel, it's just a little bit of a bow here, and you'll see the location of this galaxy. Boy, I think the image in uh, Stellarium is, is doing it some justice. Look at all those blues, the star-forming regions. And sure enough, the nickname is there, Eye of God Galaxy. Stephen James O'Meara was not making this up. Now, here's that little um, companion galaxy, 1232A, it was called. And I don't think it's noted in Stellarium as a separate object, is it? Let's search for it, see if it's noted. NGC 1232A. Nope, it's not. But we can see it, can't we? Right here. Very, very dim. Let's bring those mids up just a little more. And maybe if we bring this, I'm going to hit the shift key, and that'll give me fine tuning on this. Let's see if we can't bring out that 1232A just a little more. So I'm moving the black level, defining where is black going to be, and I'm holding the shift key down, and that way it's very fine-tuning. Still very dim. Can you guys see it? Very dim. That's this uh, companion galaxy right there. Shows up much better in the astrophotography. Probably this was, who knows, eight hours of integration or something like that. Anyway, that's just eight minutes for comparison's sake, but I think with electronically assisted astronomy, at least we can see the structure. We can make out individual stars. If we back off a little bit, we'll see this line of stars to the west that um, Stephen James O'Meara was talking about. Look at that, that line. It's kind of like an arrow pointing to this thing. Don't miss me. Don't miss me. Okay, we're going to take a picture exactly as seen here. We're going to do an observation of this. When I say we're going to do an observation, I mean we're going to pull up this panel. Let's go back over to our uh, planning software. And next we've got a planetary nebula, NGC 1360. And so we'll slew to it. 
NGC 1360. It's X16 in uh, Stephen James O'Meara's list. NGC 1360. And it's a planetary nebula in a planetary nebula in, is that called Fornax? I forget. F-O-R, is that an abbreviation for Fornax? We'll go back and correct that if that's not correct. Looks like our scope has settled down, doesn't it? Let's go back to our screen and we're going to, what we do is we put this title in here in this little dialog box and that feeds it to SharpCap, NGC 1360 and the mount has settled. Now it starts to do a, um, a plate solve automatically for us. So we don't have to worry it and we can actually look it up. So again, we're talking about um, X16 on the hidden treasure list. And this is, yeah, Fornax is correct. Um, it's a planetary nebula <clears throat> and it, it was not discovered by Herschel. He didn't see it. Concealed among the dim suns of Fornax, mixed within the wide fanfare of galaxies that populate the region lies one of the sky's brightest planetary nebulae, one which richly rewards small telescope users NGC 1360. This often overlooked gem has an immediate wow, what is that appeal, especially when stumbled upon at the eyepiece. NGC 1360 was long described as a peculiar object until Rudolf Minkowski identified as a planetary nebula in 1946. So in terms of astronomy, this is a fairly recent discovery, isn't it? Okay. So we're finishing our, wow, boy, it, it showed just right at the beginning. Didn't it? Let's uh, reset our display histogram because I think in this version, it really works out better to do that. Let's bring our black levels over to the crest of these peaks. Boy, it is bright, just like a beacon, isn't it? Look how the sky then goes darker and maybe creates a little more Uh, contrast with the object. Now look at that halo around it. Isn't that weird? Let's make the sky a little bit darker for now. And wow, look how... Now that's 64%. There's 125%. Boy, you compare it to these stars, you would barely be able to see it as a planetary nebula. It's so tiny, huh? Let me check in what you guys are... Susan, good to have you back. Nice to have you aboard. Stu, thanks for helping out. NGC 3060 was discovered in January 1868 by the German astronomer Friedrich August Theodor Winnecke. Well, how about that? So your, your data disagrees a little bit. Oh, maybe it's because uh, people described it as a peculiar object until Rudolf Minkowski uh, identified it as a planetary nebula. And you can see why we would have just thought of it as a peculiar object because it just looks like a very bright star with that halo around it, doesn't it? Uh, it's, it's typical of large evolved planetary nebula. It's one of the few examples of large high excitation planetaries. Oh, that sounds very exciting, doesn't it? Italian astronomer Mario Perinotto in the Observatory of Florence studied the central star spectrum in the early 1980s and placed it in the It's a hot subdwarf with only about one-tenth the sun's diameter and half of its mass. This is a bright little star for a small guy, isn't he? It's suspected to be a variable. It has a claim to fame. Um, It was the first star to be imaged by the EUVE satellite. <clears throat> the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy used. This is the one they used. And in 1978, also used by the International Ultraviolet Explorer, the IUE, found that fast winds arise from planetary nebulae. The winds have remarkable speeds of 2,000 to 4,000 kilometers per second, which make them among the fastest moving phenomena in the universe. 
And sure enough, the winds were confirmed by this planetary nebula. We're at 4 minutes and 20 seconds. So the shock of this inner stars, you know, ejecting this material out is pushed along by that wind. It's the old red giant envelope and a second interior radiationless shock closer to the star where the radio component of the wind speed drops from its 600 miles per second to Mach 1 in the hot bubble interior. So this is a slowly expanding red giant envelope halo. And he says you don't hear much about it from astronomers in the north, and that's surprising. Let's see. Winnicky, yeah, co-discoverer. Peculiar planetary. You know, a lot of times we get a more defined shell, don't we? Almost makes it look like a planet, but in this case it looks like maybe there's a lot of fog tonight. A bushy brow of nebulosity. Mm -hmm. Look how he's pointing out that over here, there's more nebulosity. So he believes that's part of the inner shell. And there's a break between that inner shell and this outer shell, he says. He says, as a result, it almost could remind you of a spiral galaxy, but it's actually a planetary nebula. This was just six minutes, six minutes of integration. Let's see where we're looking. This is a uh, 1360. So we're going to go NGC 13. Targeting list. All right, let's um, let's make sure we grab a picture of our. It's just said that OBS disconnected and reconnected again. Sorry about that. That might be here with our internet. Now let's go next target, and for our next target. We're going to look at a galaxy, NGC 1398. NGC 1398. Pick up some of these and then in our next live stream we'll skip over to uh, the Caldwell list and um, the secret deep. Okay, so 19 is a barred spiral in Fornax, 52 million light years away. It's uh, large. That'll clear that, I believe, as a part of the sequence. Don't let me down, sequence. Or is that the galaxy? That must be the galaxy. Yeah, so it's kind of a... We're seeing it, I guess, face on, aren't we? Let's reset this display history. I thought I had that in the sequence, but maybe I don't. And that's not actually a bad color balance right there, is it? Let's zoom in some. So that's 100% right there. Let's let that build a couple of frames. Um, he says it's hard to find, but it's conspicuous once you know where to look. 1868, Winnicke discovered it. Uh, he was sweeping for comets in Karlsruhe, Germany. He discovered it in a four and a half inch refractor. It can be in high res images, it looks impressive, seemingly symmetrical, has a dense inner ring with a rope like texture. Uh, that surrounds a bright central bulge and bar. Are you guys seeing the bar? The galaxy is inclined 40 degrees from edge on. So the inner ring is elongated with its major axis parallel to the bar, whatever that means. Um, the inner ring is a pseudo ring 
It's not continuous, but comprised of several spiral sections. The brightest segment starts in the northeast just beyond the bar's minor axis and extends through three quarters of a revolution. The corresponding symmetric component, which begins in the southwest, is not as prominent. Uh, further out, the galaxy has long, narrow blue spiral arms, each of which completes almost a full resolution, possibly forming another pseudo-structure. The arms are dappled with discrete, bright areas. But these are quite faint when compared to the nuclear region. The outermost galaxy, the arms appear as dim, flocculent structure. Flocculent. I've got to learn to use this word. Flocculent. Okay, let's, uh, let's zoom in a little more and see this flocculency. <laughs> flocculency. Now this is the bar, apparently, and this is the inner ring system. But look, we're making out that outer ring system, aren't we? Tell you what let's do. Let's bring our blues. I'm a little bit red-green colorblind. Hmm. Is that too much blue? Boy, that if that's the width of the bright core, then this blue is way outside of what we're seeing. So let's go back here. Yeah, this is this is the blue out here which we would find if we imaged longer. This is just five minutes of integration. Yeah, this, this sky is so... light polluted or something. I think it's just going to require some more time, but this is the inner ring, which is more of a whitish, and then this outer ring. I wonder if we dial the blue up just a little bit. No, that's going applying to the whole sky, isn't it? Six minutes. See if Omera says anything else about this. Um, he says, um, looks a lot like M95 to him, but that's an illusion. M95 is twice as close, and NGC 1398 is twice as large. 107,000 light years wide and 300 billion suns. Visually, it looks smaller than the apparent diameter listed in the table. It's because those dimensions include the galaxy's dim outer arms, which cannot be seen until you image all night. <laughs> but the galaxy's inner parts are easy to see. And he says, yeah, the outer ring looks just like a fuzzy glow. He says, like a Russian puzzle box. Only this is a jewel within a fuzzy egg, within a fuzzy egg, within a fuzzy egg. It's had at least one supernova eruption. When my feet are starting to get cold, you know, this is the how spoiled I am in, as an electronically assisted astronomer. Well, I think that this, if we use our imagination, is indeed starting to look a bit like the outer arms, isn't it? See this outer ring structure? Like, look at these four stars. Now let's go back to the Stellarium version. And look, there are those four stars. See, look, it takes a jog right there, jog, and then comes back up. Look at that. There's the jog and comes back up. Now you might be wondering, well, why doesn't our orientation line up with the one in Stellarium? It's because in the sky there is no up and down, you see. I mean, in other words, since this telescope is cocked over on its back, look at the way the weights are east and the telescope is west. So it's on its side as it's looking to this thing. So there really is no up and down dependably with an equatorial mount. 
And these four stars, look how much they're a part of the ring system here. They're actually in between the white ring and the blue ring. So these four stars, if we imaged on this longer, we would see more of this blue ring. Are you guys making out any of that very faint blue ring in the stream? Looks like we have 13 there. If you haven't said hello and where you're from, we'd invite you to do that. Let's get a picture of this. Barely see the blue outer uh, faint ring. But the inner white ring was fantastic. Clearly barred. Once again, we hit OK. That's going to go off of the list. And uh, then we'll click up here in our sequence and say, run for the next target. And then in our uh, targeting software, let's click this run here and see if we can gain any more targets. Here's a galaxy in LYN. What is LYN? Linux? <laughs> it's, um, let's, let's slew there. LYN. Lin, Lin, Lin. This is um, X forty seven, and it's NGC twenty six eighty three, and this is a galaxy in Lin. Uh, X47. You guys are not helping me out with this Lin Galaxy. Lin Lynx. L-Y-N-X. Lynx. Oh, rats. I didn't give it the right name. Rats. I'll have to change that name up there. So this is uh, NGC 2683. NGC 2683. That's Starlink. NGC 2683. There we go. Wow, it's edge on, isn't it? Do you see the uh, telescope symbol? Slew to it. Looks like we're um, in between east and northeast. And you can see that in the scope camera because this camera is looking from the south as if the scope were a rifle and we would look and aim directly toward the North Pole. And so if it's aimed in that direction, that means it's looking off to the northeast, see. And it looks like we're about uh, 25 degrees above the, um, the horizon. You can see the roll-off roof observatory. There's the roof rolled off in this uh, picture, you know, photorealistic horizon for uh, Stellarium from our own uh, viewing area. And there it is. Wow, so it's not quite edge on, but very close. Look, there's a nice little, looks like a companion galaxy there, isn't it? They call it the UFO galaxy because it looks like a flying saucer, huh? Okay. So we're looking in the constellation of as a slide screen. And those are kind of hurting us a little bit. But in spite of all those, what apparent appear to be some clouds on the horizon, in spite of that, it looks like we're still able to pick this out and peer through all that uh, mist and see this UFO galaxy. That's 100% uh, right there, just for perspective. Wow, that's a beautiful galaxy. I can see why Stephen James O'Meara would put this on a list of hidden treasures, can't you? This is X47. Uh, looks like William Herschel discovered it in 1788. It's supposed to be 19 million light years away. It's nearly edge on. It's the brightest of some two dozen galaxies in Lynx. 
It's not named after a creature from ancient Greek mythology. Anybody who's going to look at this constellation would need the keen eyes of a lynx, said Johannes Havelius, who created uh, the lynx constellation. And Stephen James O'Meara regrets that people don't turn their telescopes to this galaxy very often because um, it really is beautiful. And he said that the folks at Astronaut Memorial Planetor Planetarium nicknamed it the UFO a, a galaxy because of its visual appearance as reminiscent of the silver saucer so commonly reported by UFO enthusiasts. But in color images with large telescopes, you see cresting waves of dusty debris dappled with blue and red incendiary embers rippling out from a dense cloud of yellow light igniting from a spark at the galaxy's core. Wow, you know what? I think we're able to see some of that emanating stuff. Let's zoom in a little more. Look at the way we can see some of that emanating stuff. And there is that companion, ever so faint. Let's make the background a little bit darker. And there's that companion. Boy, it is faint. But look how we can see stuff emanating from the disk. Like I said, I often wonder if this white bar makes any difference at all. I don't think it does. I guess if you do that, it does. <laughs> but anywhere from here all the way over to there, it just doesn't seem to matter that much. So I'm glad it's there, but I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, let's bring the reds down one notch. Yeah, that's more pleasant, isn't it? Maybe that's too much. Okay, so this is X47, NGC 2683. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. So again, we're looking east, east, northeast. Dave, David Samard, hello sir from winter. There are two pearls where dust piercing starlight is packed tightly enough together to overpower the region's dense shrouds of dust. We can see the core well. That's just six minutes of integration. There's a distinct ripple of darkness on either side of the core. It's stunning photographically. He says it's a delicate flower visually. It takes much time to see the details. Well, it's a beautiful galaxy, huh? So let's do the observation here. This UFO galaxy nickname is super active with lots of um, gases bursting up from its core. We could make them out as faint, um, a faint halo above the core. Stu, I was called the delicate flower by my gym teacher. <laughs> Stu, you're funny. All right, we're going to run this. Um, oh, we picked up one. Here's an open cluster. 
All right, let's start the um, next target on the sequencer and slew to this open cluster. This is an open cluster in Monoceros, which always makes me think of a rhinoceros, but I think is actually a unicorn. 2353, 2353, and it's a, an open cluster and whoops, an open cluster in Monoceros. And this time I'm going to remember to pick up the NGC number 2353 while that's settling. And I turn up the music a bit, Let's see where it is. It's on 40. Four, so I'm going to put it back down there and I'm going to go fill up my water. I am thirsty all of a sudden. I will be right back. music back down should be about where it was everybody uh, okay on the audio look at all this star field my goodness that's just gorgeous let's do a reset up here and there are so many stars there Stu you have an estimate on how many uh, how many stars we've got here Which is the cluster? Is it right here in the middle? Let's look at our um, uh, what's it called? Uh, deep sky image annotation. Oh, it's off a little bit. Let's do um, a solve only so that it can uh, refine us. And center because I think the cluster must be right here in the middle and it's kind of superimposed over the top of a thousand points of light. Stu, are you counting these? Okay, so it it did the plate solve. Now let's do our deep sky image annotation. Yeah, there we go. So this is 2353 and here's 2351. 2351 is here and 2353 is right there, exactly in the center. How would you have ever, ever noticed that that's an open cluster? How, how in the world? This is uh, X40. Who found this thing? Herschel, he discovered everything. Uh, 1790. Oh, wait, I'm reading on 41. I was getting confused there. Let's go back to 40. Uh, also, Herschel, he discovered it in 1785.
Omira was looking for 2349, but he found 2333. A stunning island of stars, rich stellar sapphires and rubies. I suppose. So many riches occupied this region, I decided to call it the Pirate's Paradise. Ooh. Pirate's Paradise. Uh, Avery's Island. Captain Avery was a 17th century pirate whose capture in 1695 of the Ganjai Swai, the largest ship belonging to the Great Mogul, made him a legend. Oh my goodness. He says the section of the sky is a wonderment. Color images show numerous clusters and stellar groupings tangled in a vast network of reflection, dark, and emission nebulosity in an irregularly round area spanning more than six moon diameters. The eye can only look upon this beautiful chaos with fuzzy thinking. Here, graceful folds of glowing gas are shaped into long wings by the dark nebulosity surrounding them. The wings are surrounded by Van Gogh-like swirls of pastel, pa pastel patches and clumps of starlight. Oh, I see the orange star he's talking about. Look, that's as orange as can be. And that one's orange. He's right. Boy, it is beautiful after you study it, isn't it? Let's just look where we are, um, and look at that orange star. Let's look where we are. This is um, NGC 2353. NGC 2353. I'll have to figure out why our um, targeting software is opening up a new copy of Stellarium and then not, not actually working. Boy, where do I say now? Is this the button that means now? Set time to normal rate. Set time to now. There we go. I keep holding the control key down as I turn my mouse. So we're looking now at east, southeast. And for orientation, Here is Sirius, and the three belt stars point in this direction. Boy, that's an interesting bunch of nebulosity there, isn't it? This is kind of what he was talking about. So much beautiful nebulosity there, huh? Okay, that's seven minutes, plenty for an open cluster. Let's um, do the observation here. And um, I'm just going to say, with deep respect to Omira, this pirate's paradise just looks like a whole tapestry stars, although we could see some of his orange stars. You know, as I was typing this in, my mind went back to all the times in Starry Night Pro when I would start to type and uh, the note field would be locked and I couldn't type anymore. I finally got so weary of it, I, I went to the forum. I went to the, you know, where you, and I reported to Starry Night again. It was months before they answered. I complained so much, and I said, you know what, I quit. And I stopped using Starry Night Pro just because of that glitch that they acknowledged, and they saw it in my videos, and they knew it was there. Just yesterday, he, you know, the Kieran, the guy who does the forum, among other things, I'm sure, I think there are only six or nine employees in, in simulation curriculum. They're so focused on... Um, other things now, that they're leaving Starry Night Pro to languish, he refunded my money yesterday because he felt so bad that I had put so much into those videos and tried to convince people how beautiful it was, and it was. It was beautiful. It just wouldn't work. And he refunded my money, apparently. Now, I haven't seen it come back on my credit card yet, but I'm sure it will. Uh, but I was just thinking how pleasant this is now in uh, Deep Sky Planner 8, uh, programmed by Phyllis Lang, 
how pleasant it is not to worry about that limitation anymore. So anyway, there's that open cluster. You know what I think we ought to do before we leave here? I'm just going to stop live stacking manually and go back to Solarium a second. I kind of would like to just take a quick stop. I know we're at, uh, we just have 40 minutes left, but look how beautiful this area here is. And I don't think I've ever tried to image this part of the night sky before. It's the double met cluster. And this is called, let's call it um, uh, CR465 maybe. CR465. And let's live stack this just for a minute. Clear the previous live stack. Something new there in this edition of SharpCut that I haven't seen before. CR465. The double cluster and what else is it? Double mint cluster and seagull's wings. Double, whoa, double mint cluster and seagull's wings. Did I clear that? I think I did. Okay. Does anybody see anything of what we're supposed to be looking at here? Oh, look, here's that nebulosity. Let's reset this. And let's move this over to about right there. And let's Go down with the blues and down with the green and then bring these mids over a little. Wow, isn't that pretty? Already, that's just 80 seconds. Every few minutes, getting the circle of waiting, missing big chunks of what you're saying uh, Stu says, hats off to them. Nice gesture. That is a nice gesture, isn't it? And I sent him a thank you note, and I, and I said, if you guys do choose to do this, this is really nice of you. Wow, isn't this beautiful? Look at those reds starting to show up, all that hydrogen alpha stuff, and this little nebulosity here being lit up by that star, I bet. Kind of backlit like a neon sign, except instead of lighting up neon, it's lighting up hydrogen. Now... Where are the double clusters? Is this the, one of the double mint clusters? And is this maybe another part, you think? Let's go back over to Stellarium here. Why does that look like it's wafted? Is it because we didn't lock in on a star? But look, here's the, um, here's the Rasa. So if I hit my space bar, does it realign? That's weird. You think we're in the wrong place? No, look, because that's definitely that. I don't know why it's not aligned. Maybe there's where the telescope is. That's more like it. So this seagull nebula is this. So here's the view in the planetary, planetarium software. And then here's the view in the real-time scope. Uh, this is the seagull's wings. It's not actually a double cluster. It's just this. For whatever reason, they thought that reminded them of double mint gum, I suppose. CR-465 and CR-466. 
I don't know what those would be. CR465. It's another star cluster. CR466 is another star cluster. Beautiful. Seagull Nebula. My first time to see this Seagull Nebula. It's IC2177, SH2292. Your internet connection is bad tonight. So sorry, Corin. I don't know what is causing that. I'm using the same connection I always do. Hmm. Yeah. I have gigabyte to the server, but you know, the server could be experiencing hiccups with the local area. <clears throat> so sorry. Uh, how do I record this? <clears throat> IC2177. I guess I'll just <clears throat> edit plan, <clears throat> add, and I'll just go try to find IC2177. Look up, and it found it. And then I'll add it, and it added it all right. And then I'll add observation, and I'll just say, not a part of the um, um, hidden treasure list, but looked too beautiful to pass up next door. We saw this seagull nebula. Yes, it could be the ISP core, and good idea. Uh, the seagull's wings and the double mint cluster. Gorgeous area of the night sky. Isn't that beautiful? Just gorgeous. Okay, well, thanks for letting me uh, get distracted there for six minutes and 40 seconds from the hidden treasure list. I guess that's part of EAA. Sometimes you just get kind of distracted by the beauty of the stuff you see next door. I love the color of this garnet star here, but I also love this, the seagull head and the seagull wings. This is just beautiful. Okay, let's save exactly a scene and then go on to the next target. We'll run this new uh, and we'll head to NGC 1399. NGC 1399. And look up, it's by the way, X18. X18. And what it is, is uh, NGC 1399, a galaxy in four necks. We can see the scope move there, can't you? That's a real-time view. It's using a kind of night, night vision. Five million light years away, discovered by Herschel. He called it a globular cluster. But it's actually an elliptical galaxy. And it's eight minutes apart in the heart. It's eight minutes apart from NGC 1404. So I hope we can see two ellipticals here. And one's 18 and one's 20. Yep, they got them side by side on the observation list. And two giant ellipticals lying eight minutes apart. The bright, brightest member of a gaggle of 17 bright galaxies. Wow. It's next to the Virgo cluster. The Fornax cluster is the richest galaxy cluster within the 100 million light years, within 100 million light years of the Milky Way. 340 members and maybe more. That's a lot.
I don't really understand elliptical galaxies. Do you guys? What does that mean even? Elliptical. <clears throat> it doesn't have a spiral shape, so it's just oval. Boy, there are some beautiful galaxies here. Look at, you can already see them here after 60 seconds. Look at that nice disk there, and there's another disk. So let's look at our... Um... Oh my goodness, yeah. So here's 1399 which is the one we're supposed to be looking at. But X20 is 1404, which is right here. Okay, so let's, and that's in line with a star. Let's go back to our screen. Oh, we are on our screen. This is not, not Stellarium. What am I thinking? So here is 1399, and here is 1404. So I'm gonna do this observation of 1399 first and say these just look like globular clusters to us. Exactly what Herschel called them. 1400 NGC 1399, rather. NGC 1399 looked <clears throat> like it had a supernova just next to it. Can you guys see that? Let's zoom in a bit. <clears throat> Does there are problems measuring the distances? Ellipticals are the most common type of galaxy in the universe. These have the luminosities of 20 billion suns and 15 billion suns, respectively. 1399 and 1404. 1399 and 1404. Look at those little stars there. Tidal stripping. Nothing to do with anything obscene. Um, the accretion of a large number of dwarf galaxies. Uh, just pointing to the Chandra telescope at it. Tells you how to find it. Has as smooth as baby skin. Um, I'm surprised that the view of these two galaxies seen together in such purity of form is tantalizingly haunting. It is like seeing some ghostly apparition, ill of form, or the rising mist at sunrise, which, to para paraphrase Joseph Conrad in The Lagoon, breaks into drifting patches before vanishing into thin, flying wreaths. If you're using a large telescope, though, Larry Mitchell says, beware. The main thing I remember about observing NGC 1399, he says, is the faint star located 20 seconds from the center. That always tricks me into thinking supernova. <laughs> he mentioned it in the very last sentence. The faint star located 20 arc seconds from the center. That's what I saw. And what he says is, if you're using a large telescope, beware of that. Because <laughs> you think, supernova. That's awesome. Let's back off and go back to the um, big picture here. And let's look one more time at the number of objects here. That's just a double star, just. Here's Galaxy C, NGC 1427A. Here's another galaxy, 1392. Here's 1369. Now we can see that. I wish I could toggle this on and off with a keystroke. But I don't know that there is a keystroke. Yeah, there's, there's that galaxy and there's that galaxy. Please give us a keystroke for this. Uh, NGC 1389, 1387, 
1379, 1381. This is just six minutes. 1382, 1380, 1378, 1374, 1380A, and IC0. Look at them now without all that image annotation. And let's just appreciate all of these galaxies. Sloon here like gravel on a blacktop driveway. Mm. Just thrown in there. It does look like Virgo. Beautiful, huh? Okay, let's snap a picture here. And this is going to be our Virgo cluster picture. Except it's not. It's Fornax. And we already did 19. Let's add the observation for 20. And we'll say Omira Omira painted a picture of these two 1399 and 1404 uh, being super smooth. But what caught my eye was the tiny star just 20 arc seconds from the center of 1399. There are tons of galaxies in this shot. Beautiful. All right, we've only got 19 minutes left. Let's make time here. Two degrees by 1.1 1 .1 and a quarter degrees, something like that. Or, yeah, two degrees by one and a quarter, I think it is. This is a barred spiral. Wow, it's a beautiful galaxy for sure. Uh, Herschel called it a very remarkable nebula. One of the most stunning barred spiral galaxies in the night sky. How about that? 160,000 light years wide, 200 billion suns. It is a match for our Milky Way. Near perfect symmetry, two long arabesque arms. What is this next question? Could not rename, so these might not be getting named correctly in my file. I don't know if anybody's using the most recent uh, version of SharpCap, but must be having a problem with the way the sequence is running to rename things, sadly. Let's uh, reset the display histogram first, yeah. Uh-oh, clouds! But fortunately, we did get a look at this before the clouds took it away from us. Let's look at the sky cam real quick. Yeah, look at all those milky white clouds coming in. You know, we knew they were coming, but we just hoped that uh, they'd stay away long enough. And sure enough, for the most part, they have. Look at that. That is going to be beautiful, isn't it? That's 100%. Wow. It's... Um, Two long arabesque arms spring from a central bar centered on a dazzlingly bright nucleus. That bar measures an awesome 94,000 light years in length. 94,000 light years. About three times the distance of the sun from the Milky Way center. Careful inspection of the structure of 1365, however, reveals that the galaxy is a less perfect system than NGC 1300 in Eridanus, the prototype and most glorified barred spiral galaxy in the heavens. Thirteen sixty five's bar is ever so slightly warped and less smooth than thirteen hundred. And its arms are more open, making it more of an intermediate class of barred spiral between SBB and SBC. I raised my pitch there so you can see there were capital. Um, it's 27 degrees from edge on, so the spiral nature is comfortably revealed, has four well-developed arms, two major ones and two rudimentary ones. I don't think we're seeing the rudimentary ones yet after two minutes and 20 seconds. 
let's pull the blacks down a little so the sky is a little more contrasty with those arms. And let's make the mids a little more apparent until the sky starts to show all that confetti. Appreciate you guys being with us. Stu and everybody else, you guys are awesome to make astronomy a team sport. It makes it a lot more fun. Let's zoom past the optical limitations and see if we can pick out the other two arms. I'm not seeing them. Let's go look at this in Stellarium. And let's look. Here are the two arms that we're seeing. Let's look and see if we can find these. Anybody see them? Because I don't yet. Let's make the sky a little darker. Are they right here? Maybe I'm starting to see them a little bit. Looks a little too reddish, doesn't it? Let's look at these two stars and see where they are in Stellarium. Maybe these? So that's the non that's the side that doesn't have the extra spirals. So the extra spirals, spirals are supposed to be over here. And they would be kind of trailing this arm. At five minutes, we're not seeing them, are we? You guys are not saying it either. Make the sky a little darker. Tell you what, let's make the reds a little darker. And then let's pump up the mids. Yeah, now this one's starting to come in, I think. Yeah, right there, we're starting to see that trail. See that trail there? That's that trail here, the hub, where it gets wider there. See? That hub is the beginning of that arm, and then that arm is in between. Boy, that would have been hard to pick out. It is a beautiful galaxy, though, isn't it? All right, we just got 10 minutes left. Let's go ahead and save a picture of this one. Boy, that is beautiful. I wish we had more time on that, but we'll come back to it later. Let's uh, do this observation and say, we had a tough time picking out arms three and four, but arms one and two were beautiful. about the size of the Milky Way. Gorgeous. Ten minutes left in the stream. Let's go to NGC 2440. It's a planetary nebula. NGC 2440 and it's X41 a planetary nebula in is it pupus? P-U-P-I-S is that what it is? 41, yeah, X41, X41, pupus with two P's. Right, somewhat elongated nebula with two distinct central condensations and 
fainter outer filaments, all of which was surrounded by a faint halo. Uh, NGC's 2440's puzzling nature magnified in 1998 when, the J, when J. Alberto Lopez from the Universidad Nacional Autonoma Aut Autonoma de Mexico and his colleagues discovered that three pairs of lobes were emerging at different position angles from the nebulous core. Wow. So the new Hubble Space Telescope wide field camera images complicated even more. It shows a central star sitting in an irregular hollow surrounded by a shredded chalk white ring. Got to sort this thing out where it says it's not naming it correctly. All right, let's bring these blocks back down here where they're going to have to be. Maybe right there. Let's reset this. Yeah. And then, oh my goodness, look at that. We can already see that it's irregular, can't we? Look at that. Isn't that cool? Look at all that material that's been ejected out. Look at that jet there. And look at these different poles here. This is one mixed up planetary nebula. Wow. How high can we get those mids? It's so tiny, isn't it? Let's go look at it in Slurry. It's NGC 2440. NGC 2440. Sorry about that. NGC 2440. The Albino Butterfly Nebula? Boy, look, there's our, there's our field of view. That's exactly what it's looking like, isn't it? Wow, isn't that cool? Albino Butterfly. So I guess because here's a butterfly wing, and there's a butterfly wing, and somebody thought it was albino because it's white in the middle. And look at that little jet that's going out this direction. And then these are like the antennae of the butterfly. Let's look and see what part of the night sky we're looking in. It is right above that treetop, above this building. <laughs> it's sitting at 15 degrees. How about that? So that must be an 8 degree tree. I'll try to remember that. 8 degrees right here. Probably 10 degrees there, huh? So we are southeast almost due southeast. Wow, that's cool. And it looks like it has a cluster around it too, doesn't it? The Albino Butterfly Nebula. Wow. This is the real live, real-time view now. There's that little antennae. So what do you say we bring the blues down a notch? And then bring, brace yourself, it might be a bright white page. And it'll splash real quick and it'll blind you for a second. Yep, right here's what we want to see though. So this is the filament stuff, and this is one tendril, and here's another tendril, which makes it even look more butterflyish. And look at this bright core, and look at that tiny, tiny little central star. That's just gorgeous. So 
So there's a tendril and there's a tendril. Boy, that's beautiful, isn't it? 928. This must be our last object, gang. We didn't do bad. We ended up right here on X41 NGC 2440. The Hubble image rocks four tendrils. We could see the um, uh, jets shooting out in the direction of the butterfly's uh, antennae. But the tendrils weren't as obvious. Just two butterfly wings. Beautiful. All right, there we go, gang. Man, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, we are so grateful that you help us make astronomy a team sport. You know, the old days, people sat out there in the cold. What is it now, 25.2 degrees. They had an eyepiece trying to stare at just the live image. They couldn't live stack like this and pull out, you know, the six minutes of integration like we have here. And uh, this is a new dawning for... Um, uh, astronomy for sure. The fact that we can do this together and even if you're watching this as a video recording uh, the fact that we can do it like that as well. Thank you and welcome to you as well. If you don't mind uh, uh, click subscribe if you like content like this and that thumbs up uh, you know like this so that it'll uh, climb in other people's searches and thank you for being a part of this and I hope you'll stop back again. We're gonna do a series of three of these Lord willing very close together uh, tonight and uh, See, when was it? Uh, tonight and see, Saturday night, January 14th. And then Tuesday night, January 17th, we'll go 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. And then Friday night, January 20th, 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We hope you come back on Tuesday night. This coming Tuesday night, we'll do, Lord willing, the secret deep list, try to catch up some there. And then on Friday night, we'll go back to the Herschel 400 list. Hope you'll come back and make it a part. Have a great evening, the rest of your weekend, and uh, God bless. Thank you so much to the Lord for making these beautiful objects that we could see, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one.